I'm going to make some brief opening remarks, and we were then to to hear from uh, doctors. James Simeon, who unfortunately, fortunately for him, he's in Europe at, in Oslo, and he was on his way to his uh, hotel to connect uh, via the internet, and we might still have him a bit later, but at the moment we're not sure about that. So this panel is intended to address one of the objectives of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, Act or IRPA, uh, which is to protect and maintain the security of Canadian society. And uh, how it does that, another objective, of course, is to promote international justice and security by fostering respect for human rights. Uh, how does IRPA address those objectives? Well, part of the answer is in sections 34 dealing with inadmissibility for security reasons and section 35 inadmissibility for human or international rights violations these as i expect most of you are aware apply equally to refugees and persons in need of protection one of the consequences is if they are found to be inadmissible is that they can't be referred to the refugee protection division Today's panelists will focus on whether this is the answer to protect Canada's security in the refugee context. Uh, Dr. Simeon, hopefully he'll be with us shortly. Uh, James Simeon is a, an associate professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration at York University. He has an extensive uh, biographical record his career in international refugee law, international human rights law. He was, before joining the York faculty, he was the first executive director of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges, and before that he was a member and coordinating member of the Refugee Protection Division of the IRB. Uh, Holly Holtman, all of our presenters this afternoon have extensive experience in these matters. Holly Holtman's current role is as Senior General Counsel at the IRB, and she's worked as a legal advisor for the Government of Canada in a variety of capacities, several different departments, uh, including the Department of Justice, uh, fisheries and Oceans. He, she's a survivor of the Privy Council office, I'm sure is an experience which scars uh, people who have worked there for life. Uh, and uh, she is going to be speaking to us this afternoon on the subject of uh, subversion and espionage. Dr. Joseph Rickoff is a professor at the Faculty of Common Law at the University of Ottawa where he teaches, he's an adjunct professor, and he teaches the course of international criminal law. And his expertise, long expertise in uh, relating to geno genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and he's going to address those uh, topics in the context of the sections of IRPA that uh, we are considering this afternoon. And then finally, uh, Nathan Benson will be speaking to us uh, I've been told that the first three speakers were meant to be primarily descriptive in nature, describing how IRPA applies in, the, in this context. And then Nathan Benson, who is the legal and research director of the University of Ottawa Refugee Hub, was going to bring a somewhat different perspective to the topics this afternoon uh, and a more critical uh, perspective. And Dr. Rickoff will be speaking uh, to us about uh, Section 35 of IRPA, and um, in particular the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Essokoa. Rather than try to see at this point whether we can get uh, Dr. Simeon, I think what we'll do is we'll proceed directly to uh, Ms. Holtman, uh, 
and she will be discussing inadmissibility for security reasons under Section 34, and in particular, as I've noted, with regard to subversion and espionage. And then uh, following her presentation, she has a PowerPoint. So those of you who are tuning in remotely, I'm, I'm uh, told that uh, this session is being channeled to three other universities, Montréal, Ryerson, and uh, I believe York. What you will see on the screen then is Ms. Holtzman's uh, PowerPoint presentation. And she will then be followed by Dr. Rickoff. And then again, uh, perhaps what we might try to do is to have Dr. Rickoff, if he'd be so kind to do so, to touch on what Dr. Simeon was going to speak about, if uh, at all possible. And if by that stage we might have him uh, with us remotely. And then finally, we will have uh, uh, Professor Benson speaking about uh, sections 34 and 35 of VERPA from a critical lens and discussing in particular whether they are overbroad in their application and interpretation and whether that results in too many people being found inadmissible and subject to removal orders. With that uh, introduction, I will invite Ms. Holtman to come to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much, Justice uh, Mosley, uh, for that warm welcome. Yes, it's true, uh, a stint at PCO is something that's survived, and uh, I solved the problem of how to escape uh, my stint at, G at uh, PCO by um, getting pregnant with our second child, and so that was in a graceful exit out, and uh, I've moved on to other interesting things, as many of you know in the room, uh, work at the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. So today I'm going to be speaking, as Justice Mosley indicated, uh, with respect to sections 34.1a, uh, espionage, and b, subversion. I'm going to just be loosely taking you through it in uh, 15 minutes and no more than 15 minutes. Uh, the, the legis not just the legislation and the changes that have uh, occurred recently, but also, of course, the case law and how it's been interpreted. So I thought it was fitting that I, I bring my materials in an I spy bag, given that I was speaking on espionage, so I, I'm prepared for my espionage presentation. Maybe it doesn't need to stay up here. So quite simply, uh, Section 34.1, you'll see on the screen, uh, reads very straightforward. Uh, a permanent resident or a foreign national is inadmissible on security grounds for A, engaging in the act of espionage that is against Canada or contrary to Canada's interests. So it seems straightforward. Uh, I think what's of interest there is that this is a different version that we would have seen um, prior to 2013. At that point, um, there were Bill C-43, C uh, Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, which was effective June 19th, 2013, provided that previously, uh, a, a little bit broader definition, previously espionage um, provisions uh, regarding inadmissibility on security grounds were narrowed in that uh, the previous legislation read, uh, a, engaging in the act of espionage or act of subversion against a democratic government, institution, or process as they are understood in Canada. So the notion that it's going to be restricted to um, Canadian interests or contrary to Canadian interests is in fact a narrowing. Um, as people may recall, that was a legislative change brought by the Conservative government. And uh, the, as the title says, Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, it did seem, it struck me that this narrowing of a provision on inadmissibility was maybe contrary to the grain of a lot of the, the amendments in that, in that legislation, but uh, here we are with that provision. Uh, oh, to you? get my water. Okay. Oh, there we go. The receiver's oh. there? Good. Thank you. So again, 
No magic on slide two. It, it's again, uh, it's B, so 341B again, engaging or instigating in subversion by force of any government. And then B.1, it was split in half. It, it includes engaging in an act of subversion against a democratic government, institution, or process as they are understood in Canada. Uh, Justice, or, uh, Dr. Simeon's going to speak to terrorism on, on, in terms of a 341C. The important distinction between B and B.1 is uh, B indicates force, right? So you're engaging or instigating subversion by force of any government, again, any government, no comment on what the objectives were, whether it is a democratic government, whether it's a repressive regime, any government, and, and B.1 engaging in an act of subversion against a democratic government institution or processes they are understood in Canada. So some qualifiers on B.1. Again, that's D, E, and F. I'm not going to speak to those, but just for thoroughness, it's there. Um, so, rules of engagement, and I know uh, Dr. Simeon's going to speak to this as well under Section 33. Important things to keep in mind in interpreting this provision is that the onus is on the minister to establish the allegation. Um, that's set out in Section 33. Um, the other interesting point here is that the burden of proof is a reasonable grounds to believe. Uh, we know that from Mugacera, the Supreme Court, that that is a, a lower threshold than a balance of probabilities. It's more than mere suspicion, less than a balance of probability, a bona fide belief in a serious possibility based on credible evidence. So, so n nothing set in stone, you don't have bill proof evidence, it's a, um, on a reasonable grounds to believe basis in terms of the standard of proof. Espionage. So uh, this slide speaks uh, to the Ku decision, which was a decision of the Federal Court of Appeal in 2001. Uh, the facts of this case were um, Mr. Ku was a member of the Chinese Students and Scholars Association at Concordia University. He was a citizen of the People's Republic of China. He came to Canada in 91 as a master's student at Concordia and was very active in the CSSA, the Students Association at Concordia. Um, he, in this decision, the court held that, in essence, a Students Association, the Federal Court of Appeal, held that the Students Association certainly could be characterized as a democratic institution. Initially, initially the Federal Court had held that uh, this provision was only meant to capture institutions or entities that uh, had a political component or a political governance responsibility, and the Federal Court of Appeal broadened that and um, held that, yes, even a student so spying, oh yeah, and I should have given you more facts. Uh, so, so it was alleged or even acknowledged that Mr. Ku was engaged in spying on the Students Association and reporting that back to the Chinese government. Um, he was in essence, um, maybe not subverting, spying, and that was in, determined to be um, something that would be captured under this provision. So one thing came to mind as I was taking a look at this, and um, I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts on whether or not Ku would have had a different outcome today given the narrowing of the espionage provisions against Canada's interests. Like, could you characterize spying on a, a student's association at a university to be in accordance with Canada's interests or not in accordance with Canada's interests? I don't know if it's a small group, if anyone has any thoughts or they want to make a comment on that. Okay, this is a really narrow area that doesn't come up a lot, so I don't expect people to be necessarily familiar with this. Um, so, I, I can say that we don't have any case law on the meaning of contrary to Canada's interests. However, uh, we do have Agraria, uh, Supreme Court of Canada in 2013. small print, need glasses for this one for sure. 
uh, in that case, in Agraria, which I don't have a slide on, it was this, again a Supreme Court decision, the appellant was a citizen of Libya and he was a failed refugee claimant. He was found to be inadmissible on security grounds based on membership in the LNSF, which is the Libyan National Salvation Front, which was considered to be a terrorist organization. So he, this wasn't in the context of an admissibility finding or hearing at the tribunal, but rather uh, the minister's uh, ministerial relief under the national, national interest exemption. And in that context, the court found that the, the, the definition of detrimental to national interest includes broad things. It, it's a contextual definition. It includes things like whether an applicant's presence in Canada would be offensive to the Canadian public. Uh, they looked at whether there was an indication whether the person uh, may have been benefited financially or otherwise from their membership in the terrorist organization and whether the person had adopted the democratic values of Canadian society. So they looked at all those things in, in determining whether or not it was contrary to Canada's interests. Uh, I, may, I, won't, I won't venture a guess in terms of if you were to apply some of those reasoning here, whether or not who would have had a different outcome based on the narrower national interests test as opposed to the, the previous version which spoke to uh, espionage against it uh, an institution or process as they're understood in Canada, which clearly the Students Association was found to be well within um, the ambit of. Subversion, okay. So subversion, when you first look at this, you say to yourself, unless you're working in this area, you've done a lot of work, you're thinking, what does this mean exactly? What is subversion? Um, and it's not defined in IRPA. So one of the first decisions that were in, uh, the courts in looking at this have referred back to Black's Law Dictionary, uh, and that definition finds that it's the act or process of overthrowing a government. You see a reference above on the slide to a decision of the Federal Court of Appeal in 2014, Najafi, although they were applying the previous provisions, and they held that that the purposes of 31, 34.1b, subversion does not include any reference to the legality or legitimacy of such acts. So there was some debate in terms of whether or not it was illicit acts or done for an improper purpose. Court said, no, broader than that, subversion by force of any government, and um, including a potentially a democratic government. So this slide speaks about the any government component that I referenced earlier. Uh, the words subversion by force of any government do not imply a qualification of any kind. So this, it's not, it's not necessarily a legitimate government. Uh, in essence, this legislation has shown that courts and tribunals don't have jurisdiction to apply the national interest test. It's not baked into subversion as a definition. It's something that you can apply, there's relief to be sought under what's now 42.1, it's called the Ministerial um, National Interest Exemption, um, but that's not something that courts can do. Also of interest, if you, actually, if you go to section six of, NAF, uh, of IRPA, six sub three, you see that 42.1 is a non-delegable power, so in essence, this is something that only Ralph Goodale can decide, is it contrary to Canada's interests, not even an officer within the department. Yeah, further, uh, this again, as noted, uh, 341B does not exclude from its ambit use of force in an attempt to subvert a certain type of government in furtherance of a, an oppressed people's claim right to self-determination. Uh, in Najafi, the individual was a... Oh, sorry. Uh, in Mac Maksudi, I've got my Maksudi note here, uh, f fighting of repressive regimes. This one's interesting because Mr. Maksudi, this is 2015 federal court, Justice Diner, colleague, um, he in essence found that this individual who was a radio operator who helped uh, Masood in um, Afghanistan, and 
through the years from 78, 90, right throughout to 1996. He was even engaged in fighting the Taliban, but still, uh, even though you may think, okay, radio operator fighting Taliban, that's a good thing, that still, this individual was still caught by 341B in terms of subversion and deemed to be an inadmissible. Yeah, this, this, the next slide that you're looking at uh, is about intention. So uh, here uh, we, I'm referencing a decision called MCI versus USA. USA is not the government, it's the acronym for a uh, citizen of Nigeria. And in essence there the court found, Justice Annis and his federal court decision found that uh, subversion is, uh, includes and is defined by uh, any act that's intended to contribute to the process of overthrowing a government, uh, or most commonly is the use of encouragement of force, violence, or criminal means with the goal of overthrowing a government either in part of its territory or the entire country. Uh, in, in that case, uh, the court looked at uh, Mr. USA, uh, the court was looking at the facts there were whether or not seizing of oil tankers and redistribution of oil to regions of eastern Nigeria could be seen to be force. Um, is, is that not only force, but is that about subversion? Is that indicate an intention to overthrow the government? In essence, the court found that it could be. Are we at 15? Yeah. Well, just one more minute then. Okay. Just thinking what's the best and most interesting thing to go to. I think I'll just go to the next slide and that will be it. Good. So, so to round out subversion and what courts have, have said and have indicated by the, mean of, by the use of subversion, uh, this is again about knowing an intent. Uh, prohibitive conduct, acts of subversion, violence imply that, that activities are carried out knowingly with an intent to do so. That's aura made. Um, a person would know or ought to have known to have intended the natural consequences of their action. Uh, the facts of the Orame decision involved whether or not an unattempted coup uh, in Nigeria would be considered to be being engaged in the subversion of a government. So here, the applicant was a former Nigerian army officer, part of a planned coup against the government, which never took place as the plot was discovered and the applicant fled. So his role in the coup was to interrupt lines of communication by seizing the airport with 50 soldiers. So again, they, they attempted to argue that um, because it didn't ex it didn't occur, that that they wouldn't be caught by uh, the subversion. Um, inadmissibility provision, court found no, um, the uh, various types of prohibited conduct, espionage, subversion, imply they're carried out knowingly, intent to do so, and uh, in just the intention alone was enough to be captured. So with that, I think you have a little bit fuller understanding of what, how courts have looked at subversion, how they've used it in terms of determining individuals to be inadmissible to Canada, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Holtman, and uh, thank you for mentioning Agrera. That was a, an appeal from one of my decisions. I was reversed by the Court of Appeal, and that reversal was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada. So I had 12 judges telling me I got it wrong, the government had it right. I'm still convinced I had it right, the government had it wrong, but that is stare decisis. Uh, I believe we now have Dr. Simeon from Oslo, and if we can have him brought online. You will see his PowerPoint. You should see his PowerPoint on the screen. It doesn't seem to be working. Ah, no, that's me. <laughs> Do we have any luck with... Uh, Justice Mosley, I'm trying to um, put my PowerPoint on the shared screen, but I don't think I'm having much success. Well, we can certainly hear you. Um, is it possible for them to put the copy that I sent out previously? We now have your PowerPoint. Oh, we've lost it again. Whatever you're doing, you did right there for a moment. There it is. <laughs> 
Oh, you've got it. We've got it. Okay, roll on. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, sincere apologies for being late. Um, as you can see, um, and I, I keep seeing this message as well that says that I'm on an unstable internet connection, so if I lose contact with you, uh, you'll know why. Um, what I'm going to be doing here uh, in terms of the title of this particular roundtable is presenting the academic perspective. Uh, others will present the practitioner perspective, I hope. Uh, hopefully you can see what the outline for this presentation is going to be. Now, I'm not going to get through this in 15 minutes, but what I'd like to do, and um, correct me, uh, Justice Mosley, if you've already covered a lot of the Section 34.1, but I'm concentrating on C, engaging in uh, terrorism. Um, touch briefly on the consequences of inadmissibility, and obviously it's a deportation order. I'd like to review very quickly the Canadian Criminal Code section dealing with uh, terrorism, part 2-1. And then I'll uh, touch on terrorist groups and list of entities. And if there's time, um, and hopefully there will be, I'll touch on the key elements in terms of a number of important uh, judgments, Krishnamurthy, uh, Perez, Village, Villages, and Shires, and then if there's time, some conclusions. Well, first of all, I want to emphasize a couple of things in terms of Section 34.1. And as you can see, it covers not only foreign nationals, but permanent residents. And I think that's very important to keep in mind as well. Um, I want to emphasize to some extent the refugee implications, the refugee law implications in terms of Section 34.1. But I'm concentrating on C, engaging in terrorism. But as you can see, D, D, E, and F also could perhaps touch upon individuals that are somehow involved in terrorist activities. A danger to the security of Canada, engaging in acts of violence, and you'll see that from the definition, being a member of an organization, and it specifically uh, makes reference, well, and it, it also could encompass, obviously, uh, terrorist organizations or membership in a terrorist organization. If we look at uh, the consequences, uh, one of the interesting things is that the minister has a right to appeal to the Immigration Appeal Division, but the um, individual uh, does not have that right to appeal in terms of the judgment with respect to inadmissibility. But also, if you look at Section 101, 1F, it says that the person if he's found to be inadmissible, cannot make a uh, refugee claim. They're not eligible for that. But it does seem to make an exception to persons who are inadmissible solely on the grounds of paragraph 35.1c, engaging in terrorism. And I thought that was interesting and worth noting. And of course, the implications of all this is that uh, the person gets deported from Canada. And incidentally, deportation or expulsion is, in fact, the most common method that countries use in terms of dealing with uh, people that are found to be inadmissible for terrorist activities. The other thing I'd like to emphasize as well uh, in terms of the criminal code is that, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that there is no comprehensive convention on terrorism. So there's no universally um, accepted definition for what uh, terrorism is. And I think uh, Holly may have pointed this out already. There is no definition of terrorism in IRPA or the regulations itself. But if you go to the criminal code, it has a very interesting uh, definition in terms of terrorism. And I'd like to underscore that most Western liberal democracies have their own definition. They're all unique. And if you uh, look at the UK definition, it's similar to Canada, but it is different. If you look at the American definition, it is very different from the UK and Canadian definition. So what is unique about the Canadian definition? Well, uh, it makes reference to acts or omissions that are committed in or outside Canada. I think that's important. And then it lists all of the offenses related to that. And as you can see, I've listed here a lot of the sectoral agreements 
dealing with a terrorism i believe now we have some nineteen of these sectoral agreements but we haven't and the united nations is still deadlocked on a comprehensive convention for terrorism and i personally believe that that's very important and hopefully it'll be achieved i'd like to underscore international convention for the suppression of the financing of terrorism that's important because in sure rush in fact the supreme court um, actually pointed to that particular definition. The other elements that are important are um, if you look at acts of omission inside and outside that are committed in whole or in part for a political, religious, ideological purpose or objective or cause, that's the motive clause. And um, that's very interesting. The UK and Canada have that, but other countries don't have. The US does not have that. And then, of course, the intention and you can see all the things that are listed there. But I'd like to point out, I haven't read at the bottom, it says um, intentionally various acts, but it, it actually excludes things that result from advocacy, protest, dissent, or stoppage of work, and so on. And of course, that's to protect um, the collective bargaining rights, the protest rights, and everything else. So those are excluded from terrorist activities. And then, of course, uh, in terms of terrorist groups, um, Canada, like other countries, including the United Nations, has a list of terrorist entities. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to emphasize a lot of that. But if you look at the Canadian list in terms of who's on that, in terms of organizations, I have uh, some descriptions here. Um, but we have somewhere in the order of about 54 different terrorist groups that are listed there. Now, to be listed is not criminal. However, it has certain implications in terms of uh, uh, being an organization and being active in Canada. But the other thing that is underscored here is participation is um, actually an offense. If you are actually enhancing the ability of a terrorist group or trying to facilitate a terrorist group, then that is um, a criminal activity. Now, very quickly in terms of the case law, and I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but uh, Krishnamurthy, and I, I must apologize, this is a, a judgment of Justice Mosley's, so I'm sure he'll, uh, he might have some uh, further comments, but in this particular judgment, uh, Justice Mosley pointed out that the officer really did not go into detail in terms of um, a finding of the inadmissibility with respect to terrorism. The person, uh, the officer didn't examine the intentions, the degree of involvement, the commitment. And it's very important to look at the test in terms of reasonable grounds to believe. And that is, a, I think, a very low test in terms of establishing that. And it's been interpreted by the courts as more than a, a mere suspicion, but less than a balance of probabilities. And interestingly enough, under Article 1FA of the 1951 Convention, serious reasons for considering that someone is, should be excluded. It's, in fact, the same test in terms of serious reasons for considering. So I thought that was interesting to point out. Um, other aspects that are important in terms of assessing whether or not the person is engaged in terrorist activities is their involvement, length of time, degree of commitment, and so on. And I found it interesting that uh, Justice O'Reilly has pointed out that you have to establish as a, a minimum some sort of institutional linkage and knowing participation in that terrorist activity. Um, there, if we look at Perez Village, uh, I think what you have is essentially the same thing in terms of reinforcing reasonable grounds to believe, and here the Supreme Court uh, endorses that particular test uh, with Mugacera. But I want to underscore that um, what's used frequently in these judgments in terms of a definition of terrorism is in fact the Supreme Court of Canada's definition of Shresh. And the challenge there in terms of the Shresh judgment was the constitutional vagueness in terms of the use of the term terrorism. And what the Supreme Court did is actually referred to the Convention for the Suppression of the Fines of Terrorist Activities and said that that is, in fact, a good definition that could be employed. 
and that is repeated. And in this particular judgment, which is from Mexico and Chiapas, and I believe it's the um, the group there, the EZLN group, um, and in fact, uh, in this particular case, the whole issue was, is this in fact a terrorist group? And was the person engaged in terrorist activity? So that's, um, on the basis of that, the uh, court actually set that aside. Um, and finally, I, I, I'm not sure how much time I got, but I'm going to uh, go on to the conclusions. Um, the Canadian definition of terrorism, if you look at that, um, what's really interesting about it is it's not only a complex definition, which is broken down in various components. I believe there are at least three elements that are crucial to that. But we actually have incorporated the dozen international sectoral conventions on terrorism and identifying these as criminal offenses related to terrorism. Uh, I pointed out as well that one of the other elements that's um, unique to Canada, the UK, and some other countries is the motive clause. There has to be a motivation in terms of the terrorist activity, whether it be political, religious, ideological, there has to be some sort of uh, motive in terms of that. And then in terms of the intention, it's clearly to intimidate the public or sex segments of the public, compel individuals or the governments to do things, of course, or refrain from doing things that these particular groups would like them to do. What's also interesting about the list of entities, and again, Canada is not unique about this. There are a number of countries that have these list of entities. The issue that's been raised with respect to the list of entities is that all of these countries have different groups on their list. There is no universal list of terrorist groups. And if you go to the UN, they have different groups than the United States, than Canada. So there is variation across countries in terms of the list. But what is common in terms of that is the listing. And what is also unique in terms of the listing is you can get listed and put on that list, but you can be taken off. And sometimes what happens is um, a group actually gets taken off the list. They were a terrorist organization, they were listed, that, and uh, 10 years later they're taken off the list itself, but an individual appears who may have been active in a particular group, uh, but no, the group is no longer listed. So that raises different kinds of issues. And both of these judgments, um, it's important to keep in mind that when the courts are reviewing them, they're looking at a very detailed analysis with respect to what kind of engagement in terrorism was this individual involved in to be determined inadmissible. inadmissible. So if there isn't an analysis with respect to intentions, degree of involvement, commitment, institutional linkage, and so on, then the courts are probably going to strike it down. And then we have, of course, um, the definition of terrorism that the Supreme Court of Canada has endorsed in Shuresh, intended to cause death or serious bodily injury to a civilian, which is important, or in any other, uh, to any other person not taking an active part in the hostilities of a situation of armed conflict. So um, I think I'll leave it there, Justice Mosley, and hopefully I haven't run over time. Thank you, Dr. Simeon. Actually, you're well within your time, so uh, I thank you for that as also. Uh, I understand that Dr. Simeon and Dr. Rickoff intend to uh, compile the results of this session for the proceedings of this conference so that they will be published at some point in the future, and they'll also be touching on these topics in a blog that they're operating. Uh, Dr. Simeon, you might want to have a look at the decision of this Federal Court of Appeal in Mejub last year. The leave to appeal in that matter was refused by the Supreme Court just uh, last week. And uh, particular paragraphs 91 to 98, I would uh, question whether the line of authority that I cited in Krishnamurthy is still valid in light of what they have to say about the uh, the meaning of membership in, for the purposes of paragraph 34.1 f of uh, IRPA. Uh, 
uh, Justice Stratus seems to have taken a very strong view to the contrary. Whether that is a part of the actual decision and will withstand further scrutiny, I don't know, but it uh, certainly calls into question whether the evidence of an intention to participate or contribute to an organization is still required. So you might want to look at that. Now, with those comments, we'll now turn to Dr. Rickoff, who will be speaking about Section 35 of her. My presentation will be decidedly low-tech. I have no power presentation. I have no notes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Section 35, and I will talk about three items in that context. The first one is we'll give a bit of a background. And while Nathan, after me, will do a more of a comparative analysis between Section 34 and Section 35, I want to point out a couple of differences already. Uh, secondly, I will discuss the uh, decision of the Supreme Court in Azacola, uh, which is now the, the main des decision uh, interpreting Section 35. And lastly, I will talk about the, the, the methodology used and some of the highlights of the decision in that particular, particular case. To draw some comparison between Section 34 and Section 35, as you heard from the two previous presentations from uh, Holly and James, the jurisprudence with respect to Section 34 has been primarily been about interpreting the notions of the activities contained in the particular section. What is subversion? What is espionage? What is terrorism? There have been less jurisprudence about the circle of perpetrators which can be part of Section 34 apart from what is being a member. Um, Section 34, as does Section 37, talk about people who are engaged in those activities or who are a member of organizations engaged in those activities. So the main of the, the experience have been primarily talked about activities set out in, the, in that section or also section 37. Section 35, on the other hand, has had very little jurisprudence about what it means to be involved in activities mentioned in section 35, namely war crimes, crime against humanity, and genocide. The reason is, is that the Section 35 does not define it, but refers instead to a criminal statute in Canada called the Crime Against Humanity and War Crimes Act. And it refers to that statute. That statute actually contains definitions of genocide war crimes coming against humanity, at least general definitions. There's a whole body of international jurisprudence giving more details, but there isn't definitions. So there's different with Section 34, where the definition of, of, of terrorism, subversion, espionage, were on purpose not defined when ERPA was, came, came to effect. And the reason being, there were some definitions out there in the legal literature, so lots of the literature, it was decided, that's something that the courts are much better equipped with to define rather than the government. On the other hand, Section 35 has definitions of the activities contained, and as it turns out, the vast majority of the jurisprudence in Section 35 did not deal with what those activities mean, but what kind of activities do people have to engage in to be uh, considered to be involved, uh, indirectly involved in those activities. Uh, so most of the jurisprudence does not talk about people directly involved in those international crimes, but to being complicit. Um, the section says if somebody has committed international crimes, such as war crimes, crime against humanity, and genocide, and the jurisprudence, I would say 95%, talks about what does it mean to have committed such a crime. And jurisprudence have been looked at since um, 1992. So there has been a whole uh, a elaborate body of Canadian jurisprudence try to explain how far the circle of perpetrators can extend to make it still fit within the notion of committed. The Supreme, Supreme Court uh, was called upon to, uh, or was asked, uh, was asked by, by the appellant, Mr. Azacola, to um, redefine what committed meant, because in the, in the view of the appellant, and some other interveners as well, the definition and interpretation of the word committed has undergone 
quite a bit of wild growth since 1992. And, 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 and by the time this case was the Supreme Court in 2013, it was felt that the parameters had, had become too broad and too vague to be, uh, to fulfill the purpose originally intended of Section 35. So what's the background of the, of the case? Now, it did help that the case was a bit opaque as well. Mr. Ezekola was a person who worked at the United Nations in New York as a spokesperson for the Mobutu regime in DRC. There was no doubt that while he was a spokesperson in New York uh, or an, an attaché, that the Mobutu regime had been involved in widespread criminal activities known as crying at humanity. The question was is whether a person who is a spokesperson is closely associated, closely enough associated to fall in the parameters of the notion of committed. That was the essence of the, of the case. And um, the, the, uh, judiciary, the judiciary track was that the federal court had agreed that under the existing jurisprudence, this person could be considered to be complicit. For, uh, sorry, this, the federal court had felt that, was, that this person's activities was outside complicity. The Federal Court of Appeal felt I was actually within the notion of complicity, and the Supreme Court eventually was of the view that this particular person, Mr. Zicola, should not have been uh, found inadmissible or actually excluded. And I can, I'll come to the reasons in a minute, but the Supreme Court decided to use a methodology which has some bearing on its final result. The Supreme Court decided to use three types of methodology to give a definition, or maybe I should say a new definition, of the word committed. Uh, first of all, uh, it said, well, since Section 35 refers to international law, international criminal law, and that body of law has its own parameters of people involved in a direct capacity, and since it is a ref reference in our legislation, we should look at international criminal law in order to be informed what the broadest concepts are in that body of law and ensure that we in Canada go not beyond it. That was the first premise of the Supreme Court. We cannot go beyond what committed means in international criminal law because the whole premise of Section 35 is it should be in accordance with, section, with, with international criminal law. That was the first one. Secondly, the Supreme Court also relied very heavily on decisions by the Supreme Court in the UK and New Zealand, which were rendered a couple of years before. This issue had already been litigated and had been, rendered, had been decided upon in 2010 in the UK and 2011 in New Zealand. So there was already some precedent there. As a matter of fact, the Supreme Court followed very closely the UK decision uh, by the Supreme Court when it gave its parameters of what complicity uh, means. Thirdly, while it was argued and the court was urged to actually start completely anew and develop a definition which was, should take a complete break with the past, Supreme Court actually referred to and relied on previous jurisprudence by the federal court. So it did not throw everything out. What the Supreme Court did, it did not, um, I would say, had a more evolutionary approach to, to uh, uh, previous jurisprudence rather than start a whole new path. And that is especially, and explain in a minute why I can see that uh, in very, very much detail. So what does the Supreme Court say? The Supreme Court said is that um, the old test, and also the old test that was used since 1992, that says if you um, knowingly participate in international crime, you are inadmissible by virtue of the word committed. The Supreme Court said that test isn't only outdated, has gone too broad. Because what it meant is that, that that test also resulted in people being found admissible for mere membership in organization. And Supreme Court said specifically that aspect of complicity we will actually um, uh, set aside because we look at international criminal law and we can't find no evidence at this point in time international criminal law has a notion of membership in organization. So we take that aside. So that was taken out. And the Supreme Court changed the test from knowing a personal participation to an overarching test that says if a person knowingly 
and voluntarily makes a significant contribution, then you are inadmissible or excludable. That's the test. Knowing, um, voluntarily, vol voluntary, and significant contribution. That's where everything lies on. But the court realized this is also a particularly broad test. So they gave the decision makers a, um, uh, some guidelines. They say, in order to apply this test, we give you an approach whereby you can look at seven various factors to decide whether or not a person is complicit. The court made it clear that not all factors are equally uh, strong or are need to be present, all seven. But if you have a majority of the factors, then a person can then be considered to have been involved voluntarily and, uh, and knowingly and made a significant contribution. So what are those factors? First, the court said, you should look decision maker at what type of organization is the person involved in. The, uh, the, the type and the size of organization. Implication being, if you are a small CAG in a very large organization, let's say the Colombian army with 100,000 100, members, that will not, that, that tends to be a fact in favor of the person who has been taken to the, to the uh, IRB for admissibility hearing. The small organization, the more likely is a factor against a person being taken to admissibility hearing. Secondly, the court said, if you look at organizations, what was the organization the person was associated with? Was the organization habitually involved in taking and in, 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 uh, carrying out international crimes? Or was it like a more a sporadic matter? Implication again being the more often the organization the person belonged to or a small unit belonged to, the more likely the person uh, should have a, 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 a factor decided against him or her. Thirdly, the court looked how long was a person part of the organization? Again, the longer you're part of the organization, the more likely there is something to be said that the person was probably involved or meant to be involved. Secondly, what was the person's career path? In other words, the higher the rank, the more likely the person had involvement with the organization. Um, then the course looked like, how did the person join? How did the person leave? Again, implication being, if you joined voluntarily, as opposed to being forced to recruit it, that is not exactly positive for, for a decision maker uh, to take into account. But one thing that the court did, it added a new factor. The factors I just mentioned have all, were all derived from either the British Supreme Court or previous jurisprudence. There was nothing new with those factors. But the court sharpened and focused the notion of complicity at one particular factor. So that you have to look what the person's duties, responsibilities are in the organization. That became the focus of the analysis for future decision makers. So that is what the court has done. Um, as a result, I won't say as a result, but before the decision maker of the Supreme Court, the number of decisions by decision makers at IRB, which were overruled by the federal court, federal court of appeal, was about um, one third of all decisions. After the Supreme Court, after initial hesitation in applying this, the decision makers became more familiar and in, in part also applying the old test became better at it to, to use this new, this new uh, uh, factor of responsibilities and, and, and duties that the, the uh, number of cases which have been overruled have actually decreased. It's now around 25% of all the cases. Although I should add, there's only been 34 cases since July 2013 that the cases do not come before the court very often. That's my overview of the court case. Thank you. I think Dr. Rickoff has taught this topic once or twice before. Uh, we're now going to turn to Professor Benson from the University of Ottawa as well, and he has a PowerPoint presentation, so I believe the technician has that, and what you will see on the screen again is that PowerPoint, but you will hear from Nathan Benson. Uh, thank you very much, Justice Mosley, and let me start by saying it's a real pleasure to be here and to participate um, in this panel with such uh, distinguished colleagues. And uh, thank you in particular uh, to Joseph for your remarks, which, which I think flow very nicely into this presentation. Uh, as you can see from uh, the title and as Justice Mosley alluded to, 
Um, this presentation takes a bit more of a, of a critical look uh, at the inadmissibility provisions in the ERPA um, in terms of you know, whether they might be uh, too broad in some ways. Um, and in particular, I think that that has to be understood in terms of the relationship of the inadmissibility provisions to the exclusion framework, which, which exists in the Refugee Convention itself. And so that's really the, the, the focus of my presentation. This is based on ongoing research with uh, Professor Jennifer Bond uh, and Jared Porter, um, with the caveat that uh, the errors and omissions in the presentation itself are mine alone. So uh, with that, let's jump in. Um, a bit of an overview. I'll talk about the overlapping nature of the inadmissibility and exclusion frameworks um, and the ways in which they diverge or are, are different from one another. Um, I'll talk about um, how the current approach to inadmissibility is at least arguably uh, inconsistent with the Refugee Convention itself. Colleagues may have um, thoughts on that as well, I'm sure. Um, I'll point to some specific examples of what we see as the overbreadth of the inadmissibility provisions. Um, we talk about six of those in, in the draft paper that this presentation is based upon. I won't have time to talk about all six, but I'll talk about a few examples. Um, and then finally, I'll briefly touch on some options for legislative reform that could address this um, uh, what we see as overbreadth. So let's start by talking generally about exclusion and inadmissibility and, and how they overlap. Individuals seeking refugee protection in Canada who otherwise meet the refugee definition um, are subject to two distinct legal hurdles, um, that being exclusion and inadmissibility. The mechanisms for these two things are different, but the end result is the same. That's a denial of access to refugee protection. So um, for exclusion, um, an excluded person, uh, the result is a denial of the refugee, of the claim for protection, often by the RPD. Um, for inadmissibility, as I think James touched on, the consequence is ineligibility to even have that refugee claim considered by uh, the Immigration and Refugee Board. End result is the same. Um, so the two frameworks have significant overlap, but also significant divergence, and in several important ways, the inadmissibility framework is um, broader than the exclusion framework in ways that, that we see as problematic. So starting with exclusion, uh, as I mentioned, this comes directly out of the Refugee Convention itself. It's in Article 1F, um, as many of you will know, and it's uh, incorporated directly by reference in Section 98 of the ERPA. It excludes individuals from refugee protection where there are serious reasons for considering that they've committed serious international crimes, which are listed here, serious non-political crimes or acts contrary to the purposes of the United Nations. Um, and to kind of sum up what this is about, based on the, the, the guidance that UNHCR has, has issued, which was quoted, um, uh, quoted favorably by the, the Supreme Court in Ezekola, it's meant to encompass acts that are so grave as to render their perpetrators undeserving of international protection as refugees. So it's really trying to strike that balance between, um, on the one hand, protecting the integrity of the international refugee protection system by not allowing it to include the perpetrators of serious international crimes, which would undermine the support for that regime on the one hand, and on the other hand, not excluding people who don't have direct or don't have actual culpability um, for those crimes. The inadmissibility framework, uh, in contrast, arises purely from Canadian legislation. It's not present in the Refugee Convention. It's set out in sections 34 to 37 of the ERPA. Um, it applies to all classes of immigrants, not just refugees. This presentation obviously is concerned with the application of those pr provisions to refugees and refugee claimants. Um, it predates Canada's signing of the Refugee Convention in 1969. Um, and we talked about the effect of, of this. Inadmissibility under at least the most serious grounds, which are listed here, results in ineligibility to have a claim for refugee protection considered uh, by the board. It's interesting to look at the legislative history uh, 
um, when Canada was incorporating in domestic legislation its new obligations under the Refugee Convention. And that was done with the 1976 Act. So in 69, Canada signs the Refugee Convention. In 76, they incorporate those obligations into domestic legislation. And at that time in the parliamentary debates, there were concerns raised about the inadmissibility framework. Um, you know, based on the, on the argument that if we apply this to refugees, it's going to be broader than the exclusion framework that's in the convention. And there was a concern that that was inconsistent with the convention itself, a concern that we think um, remains valid to this day. So it's interesting to look at that legislative history that that concern was there from, from the beginning. Um, the focus of our research is really, so inadmissibility and exclusion overlap in all kinds of ways. We don't purport to cover all of those things. We're looking at a very specific subset of those issues, which is how do these two frameworks deal with the issue of association with a group or membership with a group? Can, can one be denied refugee status based on one's prior associations? And one way of thinking about this is in terms of the distinction between complicity on the one hand and guilt by association on the other hand. So complicity is an established form of culpability for criminal conduct, both in international criminal law and, and in domestic criminal law. Guilt by association is, is typically something that's seen to be not a legitimate part of, of criminal law. And actually the court in Ezekola starts with this distinction in the opening paragraphs of the judgment and, and justices Fish and LaBelle, I believe, do an excellent job of kind of drawing out that distinction, saying that uh, culpability, complicity, arises from contribution to a crime. It can't arise from mere association. And that was really, I think, at the heart of, of what was going on in, in Ezekola and the clarifications that, uh, that Joseph outlined in more detail. So let's look at the divergence that happens at that point, right, where we have that, that course correction, in my mind. On, on the exclusion framework. So in Ezekola, the court reined in the Canadian approach to complicity, their words, not mine, paragraph 29, um, to ensure that individuals are not excluded from refugee protection for merely being associated with others who have perpetrated international crimes. So they articulated this new test, uh, the voluntary knowing and significant contribution test that, that Joseph talked about. And then you can contrast that with what's still going on in the inadmissibility framework. And uh, it, it kind of jumps out in, in this case, Al Ani, um, which is a, a 2016 decision from the federal court. Um, and the facts are quite similar to Ezekola, right? Mr. Al Ani, I'll talk about the case a little, a little more later on, but um, he, he, he was deemed to be, he was, um, the allegation was that he was inadmissible to Canada because he was a senior official in a government that had committed international crimes, not that he had committed those crimes. Very similar facts to Ezekola, right? But he's being considered under inadmissibility, not exclusion. Ezekola was an exclusion decision. So in this context, the court said, if a person has the status of a prescribed senior official, it matters little whether they were complicit in the violations allegedly committed by the designated regime. So it's quite a contrast, right? In one context, you have the court saying, guilt by association is no longer valid, right? In the other context, in admissibility, the court seems to be saying, guilt by association is alive and well. It's still valid legal doctrine in the inadmissibility context. Um, following, uh, following Isacola, there was some question mark about whether these principles articulated by the Supreme Court would be translated to the inadmissibility uh, framework. And there's an interesting example of that in the Joseph case from 2013, where Justice O'Reilly said, um, while Ezekola deals with the issue of exclusion, the court's concern that individuals should not be found complicit in wrongful conduct based merely on their association logically extends to inadmissibility as well, right? So opening the door that Ezekola principles would be applied in the inadmissibility context as well. Um, 
that door was eventually slammed shut uh, with great clarity by uh, the Federal Court of Appeal in the Canagendron case, right? Where, where the court clarified that nothing in Ezecola changes the test for membership in the inadmissibility context. Now, the Supreme Court has yet to rule directly on that point. It's always possible that a case could rise and they could take a different view. But short of that, or short of a, of a, of a successful charter challenge to the inadmiss inadmissibility framework, um, which seems to have dim prospects so far as well, it's probably going to require legislative amendment to deal with this what I see as the overbreadth of the inadmissibility framework. Let me touch quickly on um, what we see as the, the issue here in terms of the inconsistency with the Refugee Convention, and then I'll briefly mention some of those specific examples of overbreadth um, that I alluded to. So the conflict uh, with the Refugee Convention is this. Under international law, only the grounds of exclusion in Article 1F of the Convention can justify exclusion from refugee protection. So if inadmissibility casts a broader net in terms of denying refugee protection based on prior uh, conduct than does the exclusion uh, framework in the convention, it's our argument that that's inconsistent with the Refugee Convention and inconsistent with international law. Um, it's not a new issue. As I mentioned, there were concerns about it from the beginning in 1976 uh, when Canada was incorporating the convention. But because of the course correction in Ezecola on exclusion, uh, the issue becomes a bit more stark. It becomes more apparent. Um, so some specific examples of the overbreadth. Um, the, the mere membership provisions or the membership provisions in section 34.1F and 37.1A where a person can be inadmissible based on being a member of groups believed on reasonable grounds to have engaged in the prescribed acts. There's only two considerations here. Was the individual a member of the group and was the group en engaged in the prescribed activity, which depending on the section could be terrorism, espionage, subversion, or organized criminality. Um, and recent authority for this would be the Khan case from 2017. Let's look at an example of how this plays out in practice. Um, in the Begum case from 2016, uh, the claimant is a 76-year-old woman from Pakistan. She was a member of the MQM political party in Pakistan. She distributed pamphlets, encouraged people to vote, did charity work um, with women. She fled to Canada due to a physical attack, a stabbing, by a member of a rival political party. There was no allegation that she personally engaged in violent or terrorist activity, but the party had engaged in political violence that came within the definition of terrorism, right? So that was the issue. And the outcome was that she was found to be inadmissible for membership in a terrorist organization, even though there was no allegation that she actually contributed to those, to those crimes. Um, I guess building on the issue of membership, um, another issue that, that broadens it even further is that there's no, uh, there's no requirement for a temporal connection. Um, so in plain language, um, you can be in, inadmissible for membership in an organization uh, that didn't begin its criminal or violent activity until after you left the organization. So you were a member, you left, then the illicit activity started, you're still inadmissible for being a member. That arises from Section 33, the interpretation provision, that says that the facts that constitute inadmissibility include facts that have occurred, facts that are occurring, and facts that, that may occur. So again, an example of how that might play out. Um, a claimant fled to Canada, again, from Pakistan and received refugee status. Uh, she acknowledged she'd been a member of MQM, the same political party as in the last example. Uh, but she became involved, but the, the group became involved in political violence after she had already left the group in 1988. Um, the immigration division of the board uh, acknowledged that she had left before those activities began. 
but found that it didn't matter under the legislation. Um, the outcome was that she was inadmissible for membership in a terrorist organization. She was denied permanent residence status and a removal order was, was issued. Um, very briefly, because I'm out of time, there's also no knowledge requirement. In other words, you don't have to have known of the criminal activities or criminal purpose of the group that you were a member of. It's actually irrelevant uh, under the test whether you knew of those activities or not. Uh, skipping along, um, the prescribed senior officials provision, um, which I mentioned in relation to the Al Ani case. Um, senior officials in a designated regime are inadmissible um, regardless of whether they're complicit in the violations committed. Um, this is treated akin to an absolute liability offense. So in other words, it's categorical. If you fall within the definition of a prescribed senior official, um, that's, that's what matters, not your actions. So uh, whether you made a contribution to the alleged crimes is not considered. Uh, any intent or uh, personal blameworthiness is not relevant. Um, your actual ability to exert influence over the exercise of government power, which is the premise of the position, that your actual ability is not considered. Evidence uh, that relates to that is not relevant to the case. What's, what's relevant is whether you fall within the definition of a prescribed senior official. Options for how this could be dealt with. One option would be to amend IRPA to exclude refugees from the inadmissibility provisions and allow the exclusion framework from the Refugee Convention itself to do that work of excluding people who are culpable for these serious forms of criminal activity. Another, uh, I guess, narrower approach would be to reform the inadmissibility regime through targeted amendments relating to refugee claimants to address these specific examples of overbreadth that I've highlighted, as well as some others. Another, another approach could be to reform the inadmissibility regime in that manner for all categories of immigrants, right? Remember, inadmissibility applies to all classes of immigrants. Um, and finally, short-term or immediate relief could be facilitated through changes to the ministerial relief process, which actually is often cited by the board and by the court as a justification for why these fairly broad provisions around membership are okay, is that people have access to the, the, the remedy of ministerial relief. In practice, the reality is that that remedy has been largely illusory over time. I'll stop there. Um, comments are welcome. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a work in progress. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nathan. I think we have about 10, 12 minutes, and there is a hand mic, I believe, if you, there are questions from the audience. You can direct to Dr. Simeon. Are you still online with us? All right, well, we may have lost Dr. Simeon. No, I'm here. Oh, you are? Good. All right. Yeah. Sorry. I had my microphone turned off. Okay. Yes, you are controlling the mute function on your mic. All right. Um, Ms. Hartwell? Yes, I just had a comment. I don't want to take time from others in the audience if they had things that they wanted to share. But um, for Mr. Benson, thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you very much for your very interesting um, paper that is certainly thought-provoking, and I noticed that people in the room certainly perked up uh, as you started to speak. And and I would have to say that I agree with you that uh, 30, I'm not going to make a value judgment, but 34 and 35, and certainly after doing a review of subversion and espionage, you see that it is broad. It's really broad. You don't even, like in subversion, you don't even get into evaluating is the regime culpable, is the regime legitimate, just association with anything. And so, so my comment to you or question is essentially, do you think that 
the inadmissibility regime that you spoke about, um, which is, of course, outside of the refugee determination process, and it's structured that way, we find it in a different section within the Act, um, is couched within a domestic government's immigration framework rather than an international obligation of, of providing refugee protection pursuant to our participation in international agreements. So it's a domestic policy thing rather than a, uh, uh, an international obligation. So therefore governments, to me, their objective, I'm speculating, imagining, one of their key objectives is security of Canada, security of Canadians. So we don't care if it's overbroad. We, well, I am putting words in the mouth of legislators, but the, the, the objective is security. We'll just make it broad. We're happy with that. Um, and that's part of domestic policy rather than uh, the exclusion analysis and framework as you find it's about culpability. Culpability will somehow remove you from um, deserving refugee protection and it's framed that way as it's something that's to be bestowed on you and do you deserve it and are you, are you culpable? The other side of the house, the inadmissibility side of the house is, well, no, we just we're, we're deciding what's admissible to Canada, we're, this is around visas, we're entering, it's about sovereignty, it's about our borders, it's about who's coming in, and um, therefore it's a domestic policy issue. And is there room for the two of them? Um, I guess we can get into constitutional challenge, that's a different thing, but um, to me, the key differences are because their, their roots are very different. I don't know if you have any comment in response to that. Sure, thanks very much. I think those are very thoughtful comments. I mean, I certainly agree with you that the genesis of the inadmissibility provisions lies in domestic policy. Um, you know, the antecedents of the current provisions go back to the 1800s, right? And as I said, I think it was, uh, there was a choice to be made when Canada was incorporating its obligations from the Refugee Convention as to whether these inadmissibility provisions would apply to refugees. The issue was flagged, the concern was flagged, and Parliament made a choice, I gather, we know from the legislation, Parliament made a choice that these provisions would apply to refugees. Now, for me, where that gets um, tricky is Canada's obligation under the Refugee Convention is to, is to provide refugee protection to those who, who meet the definition of a refugee in the convention. Now, Article 1F provides a specific framework for excluding people from that definition who would otherwise meet it. Um, it's a carve out, right? Uh, but to go broader than that is, in my opinion, to derogate from Canada's obligations under the convention itself. Uh, there were some references on this slide to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I didn't speak to them, um, but you know, essentially those principles say you can't use domestic law as a reason for not fulfilling your obligations under international law, and you have to fulfill your inter uh, international law obligations in good faith, your international treaty law obligations in good faith. In other words, you can't undermine the purpose and objectives uh, of those obligations through domestic law. So to me, that's where, that's where the conflict lies, right? Yes, the roots of an inadmissibility are different, but applying them to refugees, in my mind, derogates from Canada's obligations under the Refugee Convention. Now, some of the jurisprudence suggests that, you know, this is sort of saved by the fact that ministerial relief is available. As I mentioned, you know, over time, that, that remedy has been quite illusory. So I would prefer to see a solution that actually applies an appropriate test at the front end in determining who's entitled to refugee protection and who's not, as opposed to this sort of faint hope remedy of, of ministerial relief that might save what would otherwise be uh, a violation of, of Canada's international law obligations. So that's my point of view on it. Very interesting. I'll just uh, add to that, if I may. Could you take the mic up to that gentleman? Uh, that. Uh, Agrera was actually a ministerial relief case, and the minister in question, the Honorable Jason Kenney, went against the advice of his department, who recommended for relief. Sir. Uh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm curious what you make of the politics of these, of these provisions, and, and, and of the way that they're applied. So I'm, 
I'm thinking of Angus Grant's uh, interesting um, empirical work uh, on the way that in spite of the breadth of provisions like the subversion provisions, they're never actually used um, in uh, circumstances uh, where they might be used, where um, where the where the politics are such that the the interests of uh, of the Canadian government link up with the interests of the actors who engaged in the subversion. So, for example, you know anyone who's been involved in the American military uh, has uh, been involved in an organization that's engaged in uh, subversion um, uh, of a government by force. Uh, every sitting president uh, could be caught by this. Uh, Nelson Mandela could be caught by these provisions, uh, but we give him honorary uh, citizenship. And so um, uh, you, you, that the panel focused a lot on the legal tests, which I think are, are, are interesting, uh, but I wonder if it misses where the real action is, which is in the discretion about when you institute these uh, when you institute these procedures, the discretion in terms of when the minister um, uh, uh, issues the uh, uh, the uh, exemptions, and I think that gets you into uh, into the political uh, factor. So I'm just curious what the panel uh, thinks about uh, about that. Well, I think that question may be best directed to the three academics on the panel. I don't know, Ms. Holtman, are you? Uh... I, I, I can I can start. <clears throat> Uh, it reminds me, um, I used to work for the government, and at Context, I was doing once a training in Africa to visa officers uh, based there. And discussion on subversion became quite interesting because the visa officers point out to me that more than half of the power, the, the powers in power in Africa came about subversion. Which means if they have to apply it, they have to actually virtually uh, find people admissible on every basis. And it was very hard for them to do because on the, on the one hand, they work in an embassy or a high commission with foreign affairs people who try to facilitate things. And they are being said, well, here are people in, our gov in the government that we, the country we're in, we cannot let them in. And the only legal answer is, and the only legal answer is that the, is the, is the uh, um, uh, no, I forgot the name, not the, the exemption provision, which was meant, like, I remember I was, I was part of the debate when uh, Bill 86 came into, into, into place, and there was a whole concern that because of the broadness of subversion, espionage, terrorism, terrorism, the provision would be, indeed, unconstitutional. And that's why they put the exemption clause in order to have an, have an, uh, have an escape clause for unconstitutionality. But as, as Nathan says, I believe the number of people who are getting exemptions, like 3% of all applications, is extremely low. And I think if the, the, the policy is to keep the provisions broad, I understand what it is. It's hard to define such, such difficult concepts. Then I, I, I believe that indeed the exemption policy should be much more in tune with the political, political realities in other countries. So I agree with, with you there. That is not being done right now. And, it, and it could, there could, there's room to actually have the exemption clause be much more effective than this right now. And that depends very much on uh, what political masters want. Because you can say very easily, uh, apply exemption clause very narrowly. Right? So, so I agree with you what you say there. All right, any um, other I, answers? Could I also panel? add a couple of points? Um, Dr. Simeon? Yes. Um, I think my approach in terms of the presentation and, and uh, my work is still um, in progress as well on this. But um, I, I think you've touched on a very important point. Looking at the legislation alone and looking at the jurisprudence alone, really did, only gives you a certain perspective in terms of the whole area of inadmissibility. And you may be putting your finger on the key aspect to it, and that is the discretion of the various officers and the way that they actually apply and interpret uh, these particular inadmissibility provisions. But looking at the jurisprudence coming out of the federal court and the federal court of appeal, and I know, Nathan, you've touched on others that may be troubling, but uh, 
I've been reassured, at least in part, that the courts are really examining these judgments very closely. And if they're not applying what, in fact, you mean by membership, um, have you clearly established that this person was a member? It's not merely a statement that perhaps the individual has made. Have you looked at the contribution, the intention, the period of time that they've been involved and so on? So I'd like to just make those observations. All right, I think we at most have time for one more question. Are there any others from the floor? If not, I would uh, just comment briefly that there is an exemption in the definition of terrorist activity for the Mandela, referred to as the Mandela exception, or, uh, or otherwise known as the armed conflict exemption, or organizations which are fighting against oppressive regimes, as in his case, the apartheid uh, regime in South Africa. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the four speakers who have made the presentations on this panel, and thank you for inviting me to participate. And invite you all to uh, congratulate them for their presentations.